Hey, quick question for you. What do you think happened here? Some kind of trauma, perhaps? Maybe bitten by a bear? What if I told you that this was man-made, caused by an actual surgery dating back thousands of years? Hi, my name is Masha here at the Bell Museum, and today we're going to talk about the history of craniotomies. As one of the exhibits here at the Bell Museum, we have this entire case on traumas and various surgical procedures. But today, we're going to be taking a look at these three skulls. Simply put, a craniotomy is a procedure which involves taking off a part of your skull in order to expose the brain. And that probably raised some more questions than it did answers. But as invasive as it sounds, this procedure is performed to remove brain tumors, clip aneurysms, or give the brain room to swell during a traumatic brain injury. So how is this actually done? This portion of the skull here that is removed is called a bone flap. Small holes similar to these ones here called pilot holes are drilled into various areas of the skull. And then paths are cut in between the holes allowing for the removal of the bone flap. Yes, I know, ouch. Fun fact, sometimes these procedures are performed awake if a sensitive part of the brain is involved. Ouch, but not really, because thankfully your brain does not have any pain receptors. Yeah, tell this to my migraines. Now, craniotomies are some of the world's oldest medical procedures, with its predecessor, the trepanation, dating back nearly 8,000 years, with the first evidence of this procedure being performed dating back to the Neolithic period, around 5,000 BC. Yeah, so this has been going on for a while. The first medical documentation of a procedure similar to a craniotomy is believed to have been written by Imhotep, an Egyptian physician, but there is no evidence of this ever being performed. And the Edwin Smith papyrus dating back to 1600 BC also describes treatment for traumatic brain injury and is believed to have been written from Imhotep's teachings. The first modern trepanation like this was performed in 1889 by Wilhelm Wagner. Now, the trepanation is the predecessor to the craniotomy and involves drilling a round hole into the skull. And typically, the bone fragment would not be replaced and the hole would be left open, but in this case, they did put it back. Very nice of them. Evidence of ancient successful trepanations can be found all over the world, including Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Now, this might surprise you. It was believed that they would have used sharp objects such as flint or obsidian to carve the holes, and a lot of them show signs of healing, which means that they were successful. Now, trepanations were genuine medical procedures that did help a lot of people, but in some cases, they also got a little bit more spiritual. In medieval Europe, there's evidence of trepanations being performed in order to let the bad spirits out. The first documentation of an ancient trepanation was written down in 1876 by Paul Broca, who you might know after Broca's area, which is a portion of your brain that is responsible for speech. He was brought a skull by Ephraim George Squire that had a square hole cut in it, and the skull was from an ancient Incan burial ground. Another discovery seven years later of a Neolithic burial site that had multiple skulls that showed evidence of trephination pointed that this procedure had been around for thousands of years. With more discoveries, they figure out that there are five distinct ways that they use to carve skulls for trepanations. If you have not gotten your ouch counter out yet, now might be the time to do it. Method number one is cutting a square hole into the skull using sharp tools such as flint, obsidian, and then later a knife. And this is not a tutorial. Method two is scraping away at the skull in order to create a little tunnel and depending on the area of the skull they were doing it at and the thickness of the person's head, this could have taken up to an hour, if not more. I promise you, this does actually have medical benefits. Method number three is drilling a bunch of tiny little holes in close proximity to each other and then cutting the grooves in between, which is very similar to the way that craniotomies are performed today. Four is cutting a circular groove into the skull and then lifting the remaining fragment off. Now, this might seem more modern, but it's actually also ancient, and it's the use of a hand drill to make a hole in the skull that would then remove that fragment. The description of these trepanation drills date back to ancient Rome, and descriptions of them can be found in writings by Hippocrates. They were pretty sophisticated inventions. They would actually have a peg in them that would take out the skull fragment. Despite all of the success of the ancient procedures, from the 16th to the 1800s in Europe, this was actually considered pretty risky. No duh, this was actually considered incredibly risky due to poor sanitation. This was before European doctors figured out that you should probably wash your hands between touching people and, you know, antibiotics. Mankind has always been naturally curious and wanting to see what goes on inside the human body and figuring out what goes on inside the skull was probably one of the large mysteries of life. 
It's very likely that these medical procedures came about from just people wanting to figure out what goes on inside. And that led to thousands of years of making people feel better. Here at the Bow Museum, our goal is to make osteology more accessible to the general public, and these videos is one of the ways that we can make that happen. So if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe, and follow our socials for more amazing bone content. And if you want to see more of this with your own eyes, make sure to come visit the Bone Museum in Brooklyn, New York.